at the end of New York Toy Fair, I headed down to check out a couple of board games I wanted to see. I challenged the makers to tell me in two minutes why a family should play the game. Then at the end of the review, I said, well, who else should I check out at the show? One thing led to another, and I've ended up with 32-minute board game reviews. That's a testament not only to the creativity of the board game community, but also how supportive and interrelated they are to each other. So here we are, 30 board games for your family to play. This is Photosynthesis. It's in our big box collection of games. It's for two to four players, ages eight and up, and it takes about an hour to play. The basic idea is each of us has our own style of tree and our own player color, and we are trying to gather the sun's energy. Basically, the sun is gonna rotate around the board to grow into larger trees and eventually harvest them. When you harvest a tree, it's gonna be worth um, a different amount of points based on where it is on the board. If a tree is on the outside, it's gonna be worth fewer points. If a tree is on the inside, it's actually gonna be worth more points. And that's because the way this game works is the sun shoots its energy down in a straight line, and any tree that hits it is gonna get uh, basically energy points. But trees behind will be blocked, so there's a little bit of strategic placement in your trees. That way, if you have, place one in the middle, it's more difficult to grow it all the way up, but when you do, you get a bigger payout. And the way it works is trees are going to start as seeds. If you get enough energy, you can grow those seeds into saplings, then uh, larger trees and eventually full-grown trees. And full-grown trees can be harvested for points, and the most points wins. This is Ship Shape by Mr. Rob Davio. And in Ship Shape, we're actually smugglers. And we're going to be running gold for the crown. Ship Shape is actually a three-dimensional puzzle game with a bidding aspect to it. And the ships themselves are actually covered with rats. Now the cargo tiles have a number of different values associated with them. The first one is gold. So you're running gold for the crown and you will get 100% of your gold value of that that you see once your ship is loaded, okay? If you have a low cannon value, you're gonna get absolutely nothing. Now, contraband on the other hand, that's the exact opposite. If you get too greedy, you're going to get arrested by the popo, right? So you want to be the second highest contraband, right? Not the highest. When you're the highest, you get arrested. Each player will get bid cards that are ranked from 1 to 10, and that's your crew. What you're going to try to do is determine which layer of the skid that you want. So if you want the top layer, you're going to bid high. If you want the third layer down in this three-player game, then you would bid low to get that third layer. Now, if you want the one in between, then you're going to have to try to figure out where to land in between the high and the low number being bid. He's got a one. I played the eight, and Andrew played the seven. So as the eight, I'm going to get the top layer here. And he gets the seven, and then the captain will get the third layer down. I've got 10, 13, 17. Andy's got 17. Captain Happenstance, he's got six. And so at the end of the round, we're gonna play another uh, voyage, right? And so when we hand out the second set of holds, the player who has the highest score will get the highest hold value. Now what you'll notice is that the higher the hold value, the more rats that you're gonna get. The lower the hold value, you may even get a nice little bonus there. Here you got some extra cannons, okay? So it's a, a way for a catch-up mechanic so that the player who has the highest score doesn't get, a, get to run away with the game. And that is Ship Shape. Hi there, this is Space Escape, um, also known as Mole Rats in Space. So this is a game by Matt Leacock. Um, he was the inventor of Pandemic and also the inventor of Space, and Sp Space Escape. Um, so this is a cooperative game, so players all win or lose together. Um, and it's a little bit like a cooperative shoots and ladders. Um, so every player here is working, we're all working to get to the center. Um, and to do that, we draw the cards and they tell us what to do. So starting with the top here, um, all players need to move three spaces and you can move in either direction. Um, so that's where part of the strategy comes along. If you land on a ladder, you move up. If you land on a chute, you have to move out. Um, before we go to the center escape pod, we need to collect 
these different tokens. Um, and all along the way, we need to avoid the snakes. So um, as the game progress progresses, it gets more and more complicated because you add more snakes. So that is Space Escape. This is Planet. This is the second game in our big box collection. It's for two to four players, ages eight and up, and it takes about a half an hour to play. Basically, the idea in this game is we are building our own planet. It starts empty, uh, all you have are these series of magnets here, and eventually it will be completely full of tiles. Our objective here is to have a certain color of tile or a certain uh, terrain. We're dealt one of these uh, face down at the beginning of the game. We know what it is, and this is basically the, what we want to see. So this player wants to see yellow, they've got a little bit more yellow on their planet. The way it works is each turn, you are going to add a new magnet to your planet. You can add it anywhere you want to. So some games have complicated rules about where and how you add tiles, not in this one. You can add it anywhere you want to, keeping in mind that you want to score your objective color. Also, the other way to score points in this game is to attract animals to your planet. And each animal wants to live in a specific uh, environment. The whales want to live in the ocean that touches the snow or the tundra. The uh, rams want to live in the mountains that don't touch the snow. And the way that works is you're going to look at your planet. So in this case, I've got the ram that doesn't touch the snow. He wants mountains that doesn't touch snow. So I have one, two mountains that don't touch snow, and that's the most I have on this planet. I'm looking at my competitor over here. One, two, three mountains that don't touch snow. So the ram comes to this planet. At the end of the game, you're going to score points for the terrain you got, as well as one point for each animal that does match your planet, as in here, and two points if it doesn't. The game is over after 12 rounds, and your planet is full. Most points wins. OK, so uh, I'm here to talk about Zombie Kids from Scorpio Maske. It's a cooperative game for a young family. You are a bunch of students that want to protect your school against zombies, which are your teacher and the director. So on your turn, you need to roll the die and add a zombie. And eventually, you will move into those zombies to remove them from the school. And you need to work in team to go in every corner of the board to close those doors. Every time that you play a game, you will add stickers on your progress, progress chart here. And eventually, you will open some envelopes, add new components that will change the game. And that will drive the kids to play even more games, to continue to open more envelopes and unlock new things. So it, it is very addictive to, it's like a surprise to open what you just discover, and that will change the game. That is Zombie Kid Evolution. This is Beagle or Bagel. It's a lightning fast game for two to six players where you're trying to decide, is it Beagle or Bagel? Each card is double sided. When we're ready, we flip over the top card in our piles and we try to be the first one to call out Beagle or Bagel. Here it is, Bagel, because I have one, two, three, four bagels and there are only two beagles. That's a point for me. We also have the opposite card. Now we're saying the opposite answer. So in this case, it would be Beagle because there's only two Beagles, three Bagels. We also have double Bagels and double Beagles to add to the fun of the game. And that's Beagle or Bagel. Uh, this is Team 3. It's a co-op game for three to six players. Uh, the box is being finalized. It's going to be vertical. But in Team 3, we're, as a team, trying to build a structure. Uh, the only player who knows what the structure is, is the monkey who can't speak. So he's going to use gestures to try to communicate what needs to be built. But the builder is the one who can't see anything. He's going to have his eyes closed. So how does he know what to build? That's why I'm here. I'm the monkey in the middle. And I'm going to try to interpret his gestures to tell the, to Jeff, to the monkey who can't see, what needs to be built. To guide him through the process. And we have three minutes to build the whole thing. So we'll do a quick round now. We're professionals, it's gonna take less than three minutes for us. So go. Okay, go. So take the T, uh, your la yeah, that's the one. Place it down, yeah, excellent. Uh, w, yes, your la right hand, yeah, excellent. It should be where? So uh, your, your left, right side, right side. Right side, w. right side, double uh, W, like a stair, but right side, on the right side. Yes, left side, <laughs> left side, like I this. Left, yeah. Turn it around. Is it good? Around, like a stair. 
Uh, yes, yes, excellent. Now L, uh, your left hand forward, left hand forward, left hand, yes, you got it. Okay, uh, so it's on top of the T on the other side. Uh, one more, down, like this, excellent. Now the Z, uh, your right hand, yes, it's on top of everything. Is it on top of everything? Just tell me. Uh, towards, towards your right side, left side, right, left side, move it to left side. One step down, one step down. Oh, yeah, it needs to fall on its face. No, no. It's, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, like this, but turn it 100 degrees. 100, 180 degrees. Turn the piece, but not, that, uh, not upside down, other axis. Other axis. No, it's the same axis the other way. <laughs> Different axis. Yes, excellent. Put it down. Yeah! So that's how you play Team 3. All right, so this is Ramen Fury, and it's going to be the take that card game that comes in a handy dandy little ramen pouch here. So if you open this up, like a ramen pack you're going to get in the grocery store, inside's a brick of noodles, except you can't eat this one, unfortunately. You open it up, and inside's the cards, rules, everything you need to play. So what's this game about? So like I said, it's a take that card game. So all the players around the table are gonna to aim to build the best bowl of ramen. And we're gonna build the bowls of ramen by taking cards from the middle, which is the pantry. And also there's blind cards up here that you can randomly draw from. Each bowl has to have one flavor packet. So I can take this and then for each, uh, spicy chili pepper, normally they're bad, but if you've got this fury flavor, each chili pepper inside your bowl is gonna be worth two points. So this here's the beef flavoring. So if I'm gonna take that, for each unique protein in your bowl at the end when you eat the ramen, it's gonna be worth up to two, five, nine, and 14 if you have four of them. So if, for example, I'm building my soup, if I have an egg in here, some tofu, and then some chili peppers, one of the actions per turn is you can flip your bowl over and you eat that ramen. That ramen is gone, but then you do bank the points here. So this would be worth five points minus one for the chili peppers, so four points. Now, the unique twist in the game is each player has two spoon markers. You can use the spoon token, take that away, and then I can actually go into somebody else's bowl. So say someone here had the tofu instead, and I can use this, scoop this out, take it, and then put it into my bowl. So it's sort of a take that, you have to watch what everybody's doing around the table. Um, and at the end of the game, when everybody has flipped over their bowls and eaten them, you bank all your points together and whoever has the most points is the ramen king. So that's Ramen Fury and that's out sto in stores now. All right, so this game here is Chop Chop by Jekka, which is a French studio that we're working with. So uh, Chop Chop is a game, uh, it's one versus all. So one player plays the vicious cat and the other players around the table are playing the mice. And these are real nice, high quality pieces, nice veneer, real wood here. So how, we wor how this game works is one player plays the cat, like I said, everybody around the table is playing the mice. The players that roll the mice are going to take turns and roll. They can take one, so he's going to move here, flip this over. Oh, he has to move automatically move this way. So we'll move here. What's under here? A piece of cheese. All right, so that's one of the pieces of cheese that the mice players have. They have to get all ten and get out before being eaten by the cat. The cat player here, he's going to roll every other turn and then move up to two spots. So he can come down here and go here, and then that, ma that mouse is out of the game. He's gone. Uh, the twist here is the mice can hide under the table where the cat can't go. So the goal of the, mi the mice, like I said, is to get the 10 pieces of cheese. They don't know where they are. They have to explore the kitchen and then get out before being eaten by the cat. That's Chop Chop uh, by... You do read through the story. Oh, Stuffed Fables is a game by Plaid Hat about a little girl who's having some nightmares about the monsters under her bed, but the monsters under her bed are real. You play one of her stuffed animals, and her stuffed animals are trying to protect her. The game goes through a storybook, and it's all laid out here in this book. So as you read it, you do read through the story, and you get to different parts of the story, and you see the little girl with her stuffed animals protecting her. But each level, each zone is here in the book, and the rules that you need and the, the things that you need are just right there on the other side as you play. On your turn, you grab some dice out of the bag at random. You're not sure which dice you're going to get. You can use these in very different ways. You can use them for ranged attacks or melee attacks or to move. When you draw black dice out, you add them to the tracker over here, 
When that tracker reaches the number of enemies, the enemies take a turn. Your health is represented by your stuffing. He would make an attack on one of these. He would roll his red dice, and we're hoping that he can exceed the defensive value as listed on the card here. So these particular ones would need a five or six in order to be removed from the board. After you're rolling, if you still haven't gotten what, you may have a melee weapon that can add a plus one or perhaps give you another ability. And when you defeat an enemy, you remove it from the board and you receive a button. You could also encounter other creatures in the dream. And when you go to those, you find choices and stories that you need to make a narrative choice as you go. So it's a very narrative game. There's a whole discovery deck of things that in different stories add different elements to the game. I don't want to show you too much here because that is actually sealed and you go through and discover as you go through the game. A bit of a choose your own adventure. If you make one choice, you might go to a different page than if you made a different choice. So we head here to the banks of Bramblebum. And there's various different things. There's wagons you can pull and uh, enemies you can find fairies who might help you. And that's a very brief overview of Stuffed Fables. Uh, Bad Bones is a one to six player game. It's basically a tower defense game where you try and protect your tower and your village from an onslaught of skeletons. Uh, the first phase is move your hero one step uh, orthogonally or diagonally. So in this case, if the hero moves here, he immediately destroys the skeleton. The hero is very, very strong. Uh, the next thing that you would do in phase two is either place or remove a trap. You have your list of traps along here. A wall will redirect the skeleton. A catapult will fling a skeleton to another person's playmat. The treasure will attract skeletons towards it. And the dragon will crush a skeleton and scare any skeletons that are around it, that are immediately around it. Third phase is move the skeletons. When you move the skeleton, you always follow the direction in which it's pointing and you turn it over to indicate, to remind yourself and everybody else that you've moved the skeleton. So this skeleton will be moving onto a square with arrows and you'll need to follow the arrows direction. In this case, this skeleton next turn will be hitting the tower. The game ends immediately if you have no more levels of the tower left. If the skeleton hits a tower, you lose a level. If a skeleton hits one of these buildings, you will lose a building of your village. If you have no more buildings left, you lose the game and the game is over. When the game is over, we will count the points. The points are essentially reflected on the trap. So each star is worth a point. You'll also be scoring points for any buildings you have that, are, that have not been destroyed. And you will be scoring points for every level of the tower that have not been destroyed. And the last and final phase is deployment of the skeletons. The way you deploy skeletons is you pick three skeletons randomly from the bag, along with whatever was placed in the graveyard, and you bring them back into play. What makes this game interesting, though, is the play mats are not isolated. That is to say that if a skeleton exits on this side of the board, or on this side of the board, this will affect, this go onto this player's play mat. If it goes to the left-hand side, it will affect the left, left player's play mat. If it leaves through the north, you may take the skeleton and place it in the graveyard of any other player. If it goes through the south, it will destroy one of your buildings. That's it, pretty much. That's how you play Bad Bones. Well, welcome. This is Outback by Michael Kiesling, where the object of this game is we are going to be rolling our dice in an attempt to acquire animals that are currently on the Jeep in the center of the table. So I roll the dice, and you notice that the yellow side is wild. So right now, I'm going to take these aside, and I'm going to set the koala aside. And I'm going to re-roll these two dice here in an attempt to get more koalas. So in this case, I'm going to choose the koala, and I'm going to place it in my outback here, and I put it in the row that corresponds with the number that I acquired from the Jeep. So I have my four koalas, and I put it in this space, and it'll score my koala one point. The game progresses if I were to acquire another uh, koala. So let's say I put five koala here because I rolled five koalas, such as that. Now I still score one point for this, but because I place my koala adjacent to another koala, I score that koala again. So now I move from one up to three. As soon as you have three animals out on your outback, you trigger that bonus, and the first one is worth plus one. So then I move this up here, and that would give me seven points for the koala. The game Outback continues until someone fills up their entire Outback, and there's a unique twist in this game. 
So let's say that I'm playing the game and uh, my, I've advanced my animals like so. In this game, you're only allowed to score the lower three animals on the left scoring track. So during the game, one of your strategies is try to move at least two of the animals to the upper scoring track because that then everything on the upper track would score. And if you look over here, there's additional goals that you can play with. So for example, the person who first fills up their outback gets uh, three additional points, or the person that uh, has five uh, monitor lizards in a row would score an additional two points. And that's the game Outback by Michael Kiesling. Snowman Dice is a simultaneous dice rolling game for two to four players and takes around five, 10 minutes to play. So how it works is everybody at the same time rolls the dice and they're trying to build a snowman. And you build a snowman from the bottom, then there is the middle, and then there's the head. But you can replace any part with the wild piece. So head could be the wild piece or the middle or all of them could be the wild piece. Once you got your snowman done, you have to roll an arrow. And then you have to say, look at the snowman go and push it all the way to the North Pole to score. But it's not as easy as it seems because everyone else could roll a snowball and while you're pushing your snow, snowman, they could flick it at you and then your snowman falls apart and you have to start from the beginning. That's snowman dice. All right, so this is Tentacle Town from Monster Fight Club. So Tentacle Town is a worker placement game with a tantalizing tentacle twist. So what's going on is we are all adventurers that we heard that Tentacle Town is under infestation from giants cracking coming from the sea. And you will take your meeple and you will place it into one of the three zones in the game. There are the docks, there are the dark, the markets and the foundries. And your meeple will go to one of those locations. And once that worker has been placed in that place, you can go ahead and say, all right, I'm gonna build a house with that meeple or I'm gonna have that meeple do something. There are different actions that each of the different zones can do. In addition to those, there are good deeds that change up the gameplay that are across the top of the board that people will look at and do things like a can calamari or supply militia. Once you're out of actions, you're going to take a event dice. You will roll it. If that number is equal to or greater than the amount of meeples that you have in the zone, you are not attacked. If I would have rolled two tentacles, two new tentacles would have moved from other zones or off the board, and it would have made that zone a whole lot more dangerous. If I would have gotten a situation where I had gotten attacked, I would have taken, picking up the attack dice, I would have rolled them on the table. And in this case, two of my meeples would have gotten eaten and they leave. One of the meeple would have ran in terror and you bring them to another zone and one of the houses would have gotten attacked by a kraken. It would have come in to smash the houses. They smashed the houses from the beach first and they worked their way in towards the mountains. If you want to have a chance to save the house that's being attacked, if you own some harpoons, you could take that harpoon, spin the harpoon spinner, or you could flip it over and I successfully destroy a harp or successfully destroy one of these. You take it off the table. Of course, that produces calamari, which is food, which you will go ahead and eat. And you also get famous because you were able to kill a tentacle. Fame is how you win this game. Once all the meeples have either been eaten or they've been deployed on the table and they're no more in reserve, the game ends. You tally up who has the most fame and they become the mayor of Tentacle Town. So that is Tentacle Town from Monster Fight Club. Thanks. Here is Sushi Roll, which is the dice game of Sushi Go. And uh, with it, at the start of the game, you get a bag of die and you blind pick your dice that you're gonna play with on each round. You choose them out of the bag and you put them on your conveyor belt. So at the start of each turn, you roll the die and then you put them on your conveyor belt and then you go around and take a turn and choose a die that you're gonna keep for points at the end of the game. The point system is scored very similarly to Sushi Go. One of the things that's different about it is that after your turn, the dice switch players, but you must roll the die at the start of each of your turns. So it's a dice drafting game. Things that are also different about this version is that if you are interested in a, a dice that someone else has, you can turn in one of your swap tokens and swap a die that you have for one of theirs and then you can take it. So that is another change between Sushi Roll and Sushi Go. Additionally, we come with scoring tokens, so between rounds you can keep score with those scoring tokens, and I almost recommend that you use them when you're playing Sushi Go. So it's a nice addition to the Sushi series. 
So this is Bloom, which is our newest roll and write games, which are a really hot type of game right now. If you're unfamiliar with roll and write games, it's where you have dice and a pad of paper and you're rolling the dice to uh, further along the game. It's called Bloom. The object of the game is to be the first to, roll, uh, to circle all of the flowers of particular colors. That's how you get the highest amount of points or to fill in four garden beds. Garden beds are these squares. So on a turn, an active roller will roll the die, and if you're the active roller, you get the first choice of the die in front of you. In my case, I would love to try to get more yellow flowers, so I take the yellow floor, four, and then the die get passed on to the next player without that choice, and they will be able to take a die and fill in their flowers. So the object is to get the most of certain colors of flowers or the most of uh, garden beds filled in, and that is blue. Trellis is a family game for two to four players, ages 10 and up. And the way it plays is you start with a center tile, which has all of the vines on it, and you start to connect and claim vines. So when you connect two like vines, you claim them with a flower. The idea is to play out of all your flowers. The first one who plays out of all their flowers wins the game. There are some rules that make the game a little bit more interesting in that if you connect someone else's vine for them, you are in effect giving them a gift and in return you receive an extra flower to play. So it's a game of cooperation and strategy, but it also can be a true competition. Kids can play, families can play. We think it's a great entry game that has light strategy and a beautiful visual appeal. Trellis is available in mass market now on exclusive and Target stores for the first six months of the year. Hey folks, welcome to the world of Bunny Kingdom where you're trying to set up fiefdoms of bunnies to score through resources and strength. In this game, we have a drafting and area control element where you set up bunnies in different squares. As we can see here, we have a fiefdom of six bunnies that has six territories, three different resources, wood, fish, and carrots, and three different towers. These three towers multiplied by the three different resources are gonna lead us to our scoring phase. We start with territory cards. In this game, we're going to draft from a pack of 10, over the cor uh, 10 or 12 over the course of four rounds to get these cards so that we can put bunnies on the board using a battleship style uh, numbering system. So this one corresponds to J1 over in this corner, B3 over in, up here. You can see our building cards, which do different things on the board based on uh, the rules for the game. Uh, some of them make your territories more powerful. Some let you interact with the board in different ways. As we go on to here, we see our parchment cards. These are community chess style cards that change how scoring goes at the end of the game and give you different goals. Over the course of the game, you're going to have four rounds. You'll score at the end of each round, and as the, as the game progresses, each round will score more and more points. And that's Bunny Kingdom. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you didn't get enough bunny action for now, we do have an expansion coming out soon in June. So this is a brand new game called Dino Duel. It's kind of like if Risk and Exploding Kittens and the Pokemon trading card game all had a dinosaur baby. All you do is you deal five cards to each player. And for this game, it's gonna be a two player game. The rest of the cards go in the center. We'll flip the cards over and play open hand just so that it's easy for everybody to see. Now the objective of the game is to score points. How do you score points? You fossilize dinosaurs. How do you fossilize dinosaurs? You can do it in one of three ways. You can either duel, you can utilize some of the benefits of the dinosaurs to fossilize them, or you can use extinction events like the nuke that will destroy multiple dinosaurs all at once. Now, in the turn, it's two actions. You can do one of three things. You can draw a card, you can play a card, or you can duel an opponent. And again, you want to duel to get points. So, level two dinosaur is worth two points and duels with two dice. And you want more points, so you're gonna duel my level three dinosaur with three dice. If you would humor me, we'll roll these. Six, six beats four, four, four. 
It's only the top die, by the way, so 6-6 six, six is really 4-4. Four, four. So you're gonna win, and you're gonna fossilize this dinosaur and get three points. That's basically how the game is played. Whoever has the most points in their fossil pile when the last card is drawn wins the game. The only other thing that can happen is, let's say in a fictitious world, we have this scenario where there's a level two, a level two, a level two, a level two, and I have a volcano in my hand. I can blast the entire board with this extinction, take all of these dinosaurs out in one fell swoop, and get a whole bunch of points. You add it up and subtract the red at the end and you've got your winner. Very, very competitive game, very compelling game. One or two playthroughs and you won't be able to quit. The Estates is an auction game where you're building this downtown urban development. It's a brand new area where you're gonna be constructing buildings. You wanna invest in the right areas while out outbidding your competition. So each of the buildings will be of a floor, a roof, or you can bid on one of these um, game-altering pieces. Whoever owns the color of the highest row of the highest building level will get all of the points for that building. Once you cap off a building, no more construction can happen. So how the bidding works is you'll select one of the one of the many wooden pieces in the game, and you're going to hold an auction. It's going to go around the table one time. So the person will be giving the auctioneer their best bid. Once the bid is completed, once it gets back to the auctioneer, the auctioneer chooses to either accept that bid, but the person bidding on it gets to place the piece, or the auctioneer can choose to pay the highest bid to the highest bidder so that they can place the piece in the estates. This is a closed economy, so everybody starts with $12 million. That money will never leave the game, and no more money will come back into the game. The game ends when two of the three rows are completed with roofs on the buildings. That third row will be torn down, and if you are invested in that row, you'll score negative points. Thank you very much for checking out the estates, bid and build. Hi, I'm Bruce from North Star Games, and I'd like to show you one of the games in our Happy Planet line. It's called Dirty Pig. Uh, here's basically how Dirty Pig works. You have pigs. They are very sad when they're clean. They are very happy when they're dirty. You get them dirty by playing a dirty card. Uh, you get them clean. I want my pigs dirty first. But if your pigs are starting to get dirty, I might come over and help you out and clean them. Pigs hate that garbage. An easy way to efficiently clean all the pigs is rain. Pigs don't want to be clean. They hate that garbage. So they're willing to go into barns. If a dirty pig goes in a barn and it rains, it can't get clean. However, I can still go in and clean that pig. And they hate that garbage. So they have learned how to bolt a door onto the barn. So they'll bolt the door in the barn and I can't get there. We established just a moment ago that I am a weather wizard. So what I can do is strike down their barn and burn it. They hate that garbage. So what they've learned how to do is actually build a lightning rod to protect their barn. So if a dirty pig is in a barn with a door and a lightning rod, they absolutely positively cannot get clean. However, all you have to do to win the game is get all of your pigs dirty. They don't have to be completely protected, they just have to be dirty. And that is the goal of Dirty Pig. It takes about five to seven minutes, you can play two to six players. We have Dude and More Dude. Uh, basically, Dude is a game where you say dude. It's that simple. It's also kind of an educational game that teaches you literally how we use language. But I'll show you that in a second. Uh, each player in the game gets a deck of their own cards that say dude on them. And it's gonna show you the word dude in six different ways. Tiny dude, dude with a period, dude with a question mark, dude with a W, dude with a tie-dye background, and dude with a whole bunch of O's. And by a whole bunch of O's, I mean there are three O's on that dude. You're gonna shuffle your deck of cards and then you're gonna say dude the way you think it should be said. So personally, I think tiny dude should be dude. Dude. Some people say it with a real high voice, like, dude, but I don't really like my high voice, so I go with a whisper. Um, everyone's going to be doing this at the same time. When you hear another person saying dude the same way that you say dude, then you say sweet. If they say sweet back to you, you that's saying, hey, I think we're saying dude the same way. You compare the cards. If they match, you're going to score them in front of you. If they don't, you're going to throw them in the middle. When somebody's done with their entire deck, win or lose, they're going to say chill. When they say chill, we're done, and we count the number of points, uh, and the most dudes wins. Uh, we also have more dude. It's another game where you say dude. Everything I just talked about is the same, except dude is how we say dude, and more dude is who says dude. Everybody says dude. Robots say dude. 
guys on the front of pizza boxes say dude. Uh, surfers say dude. Pirates say dude. Ghosts say dude, but they say it like this. Dude! Cowboys also say dude. It's the same game. We all have the cards. At the same time, we're gonna be saying dude the way we see it on our card. When somebody else is saying it the same way, we say sweet and we match up. When someone's done their entire deck, they say chill and we count all of our points. Most points wins. One neat thing about this I'm gonna show you is if you take a look, the colors are exactly the same. So if for instance, you wanted like the pizza guy and the ghost and the tie dye and the question mark, you can mix them together and both games play together. So you can either play them together or you can play them individually. It works either way. And that's dude and more dude. So this is Hanga from Hava Games, and it's for two to five players, plays in about 45 minutes, and it's for ages eight and up. This is a resource management game where you are trying to become the next chief of the tribe. And the way that you do that is you're going to have the most points at the end of the game. You gain points by gathering resources at the various locations, and then using those resources to complete contracts. The way that you gather those resources is on your turn, you'll play one of your cards, to the center area, one of the four quadrants, and how you orient the card determines how many action points you get to use in the regions. So for example, if I went here, I'd get two fish and two water, which I can track on my player boards here. But there's a twist, Honga. So Honga is the neighborhood saber-toothed tiger, and well, he's like any neighborhood cat. He kind of bothers everybody equally. If you don't spend action points to Hanga, so when you play a card, if you don't have one of your action points into his den, he will come and bother you. So he'll come and sit in front of you and he'll steal fish. If you don't have fish, he'll steal berries, so on and so forth. Every turn that you start with Hanga in front of you, he will keep stealing food from you until another player happens to neglect him, in which case he'll move on to the other player. You can also play bonus cards like this one that say go away Hanga to return him to his den. The game teaches strategy and has multiple different avenues to victory, but it also teaches that sometimes you may want to take a small negative effect like Hanga to have an overall positive experience by being able to use all of your action points, not just for feeding the cat. And that's Hanga coming from Hava Games for two to five players, ages eight and up. So this is Disney's Villainous. It is a two to six player game. Uh, it is a strategic card drafting game. You basically have a board, you're playing cards. Uh, Playtime is about 60 minutes for four players. In the game, you play as one of six Disney villains. In this example, we're playing as Captain Hook. Um, in order to win the game, you want to defeat Peter Pan, so that's your win objective. Each of the villains has their own unique objective that, and mechanics that are unique to that character. So it allows you to really dive into the game and play within that. Um, you have a bunch of allies that will help you within your villainous deck, uh, your villains deck, and then you also have a fate deck. Being that we are evil villains, we want to keep the other villains that we're playing against from achieving their objective. So we lovingly recreated all the art for this. So the illustrations is really what helps draw players into the game. Um, you can see that we have allies, items, effects, conditions. These are all things that allow you to play both during your term and conditions will let you play while the other villains are having their turns. Um, we also have heroes uh, and items that will help keep you from achieving your goal. And this was Disney's Villainous, and we are excited to announce that on March 3rd, we are launching Disney Villainous Wicked to the Core with three new characters, the Evil Queen, Dr. Facilier, and Hades. This is Jaws, the board game. It's two to four players, 12 and up, um, about 45 to 60 minute play. The awesome thing about Jaws is that it is a two-part game. There's an act one, there's an act two. The the board is double-sided, so on Act 1, on this side of the game, it's a hidden movement. Uh, the shark will be swimming around trying to devour as many swimmers as possible, while Chief Brody, Hooper, and Quint are trying to you know, close beaches, uh, save rescuers, and inevitably tag the shark with two barrels. Um, what I love about this game is it, it really wants to pull you into that Jaws universe. Not only do we have, um, you can see with all the different swimmers, these are the original swimmers from the movie. Um, we've really tried to capture the tone of the movie, of that classic feel through our illustrations. Um, and what's really interesting about this is what happens in Act 1 uh, impacts the climactic battle aboard the Orca in Act 2. So as the shark is uh, eating swimmers, it's getting stronger and stronger and gaining more abilities while the crew is losing gear to 
try and defeat the shark at the end. And this is Universal's Jaws, a game of strategy and suspense. All right, we are in the midst of playing Zorro Phoenix Rising. And as the story goes, the gods, they are really, really pissed. They are so pissed that they have stolen all of the stars out of the heavens. And we are a hopeful clan down on Earth making paper lanterns and actually sending them off into the skies. And as they rise into the skies, the magical phoenixes, they see this glimmer of hope and they start racing around to the lanterns. And as they touch the lantern, that lantern actually would turn into a star and repopulate the heavens. And you'll notice that on the tiles, there are four distinct patterns, four distinct lines. Those are the lines that my Phoenix will actually travel upon during the game. So when I come on the board now, I have to find a position where I can actually travel through one of or more of the um, tiles that actually have physical lanterns on them. So I'm gonna take my Phoenix, I'm gonna start him over here. And then on my turn, I am going to lay down the tile and I'm gonna pass through and follow that pattern all the way to the end of the path. Each tile that I pass through that had a physical lantern on it will create a star. So now I'm gonna set up all the stars, okay? And then I'm gonna move each one of the lanterns themselves. So blue first, it has to go to another blue. Then I came through this tile. Red is gonna go to red, red to red. Then I have blue to blue and yellow to yellow. And then I'm gonna come back and collect the stars that I created. And it's the first player to create a constellation of seven stars that will win. And now it's Andrew's turn. He's coming into an empty space. And so he's got two tiles that he's gonna choose from and he can play either side to extend his path. So Andrew's gonna play and then his Phoenix is gonna follow that path all the way to the end, okay? We're gonna come back, place the, the, the um, star and then move the lantern to another place. He's headed in this direction, right? So he's gonna come over here and place the, the lantern near the direction that he's traveling in and then collect his star. All right, so the game that we've been playing today is a prototype of Zorro Phoenix Rising. The components themselves, the lanterns, the blue lantern will be this beautiful lantern here. The red lantern will be this one here. And then the yellow lantern will be this nice round lantern here. And then our phoenixes will actually be three-dimensional, beautifully in flight. And that's gonna be Phoenix Rising, Soro Phoenix Rising. And remember, Soro is an entire line of three different experiences. You have Soro, the game of the path, which happens on the ground. And then we have Soro of the Seas, in which you're battling the monsters upon the seas. And here, Soro Phoenix Rising, flying and soaring through the sky. Hello, today we're launching uh, Shuffle Grand Prix, which is a racing card game by Bicycle. This is a new uh, venture for Bicycle, which has been around 135 years. It's a game, four to, uh, two to four players. Every player has drivers. There's eight different characters out there, um, all original. And all the artwork kind of has this nostalgic video game look from the 80s and 90s. Um, from a gameplay standpoint, it's a, you're just trying to collect the most distance to win. Each, uh, during your turn, you have the chance to get more distance or you could attack and sabotage your opponents out there. You can play from your hand various actions. You can add equipment to your cards. This, for example, is an attack where I'm trying to attack my opponent and it does two damage, which will cause the opponent to spin out. Which, as a result, they'll lose their top distance card. This player um, will have to switch drivers to their other driver 
Um, and that's kind of a back and forth that'll happen throughout the game. Every turn you take, you, you collect, flip over a distance card, but throughout the game, your opponent's gonna try to take that distance away from you by spinning out your driver. This is Shuffle Grand Prix. It's just the start of a future portfolio of games coming from Bicycle. Hi there, this is Sky Magic. So this is a game for ages six and up for two to four players, and it takes about 20 minutes to play. Um, so the idea here is we've got all these magical creatures and we're all working together to get them to their homes before the storm takes over. Um, and how you do that is you roll the dice. Any player can move any character. So I'm going to move this griffin three spaces and I'm trying to get him to his home. Um, one thing that makes it challenging is if you roll the weather icon, you have to draw the weather card and complete the action on the card. So here's, we've got the storm cloud cover. So what you need to do as a team is decide the best place to put the storm cloud cover. And you've got to look at your characters and how close are they to their homes. So say I really want to get the griffin to his home, I don't want to block his path. So I'm going to put the storm cloud cover here so I don't block his path. Um, another weather action you can do is the wind flip panels. So the board is actually dynamic and changes um, and it, it moves. So say I were to have my griffin there, if I flip the panel, he lands on the cloud, he's safe. But let's say the griffin were here and we flip the panel, oh no, he's fallen through the sky, he has to go back to start. Um, so one way that we can combat the storm together is by using these magic spells. And there are three different spells. You can use a spell if you roll the spell icon or the magic wand icon on the dice. We've got the gale spell that allows you to blow away a storm cloud. Um, you've got the free spell that prevents the wind flip panel from flipping. Um, and you have the doubling spell which allows you to double your roll. So going from a four to an eight. You only get one magic card to use at a time and everybody has to work together to decide the best time to use it. So if you can get all your characters home before you run out of magic spells, you've won the game. If not, you were beaten by the storm. So that is Sky Magic. Hi, this is the game Chickapig. Chickapig was invented by Brian Calhoun, who was a custom guitar builder in Charlottesville, Virginia. He actually partnered up with musician Dave Matthews uh, to invent this game. The goal of the game is to get all of your six Chickapigs from your side of the board through the goal on the other side. And you do that through a bit of a unique mechanic. You roll the dice to see how many moves you get, um, and Chickapigs one move, they slide until they hit something. You can also control your colored hay bales, which move one move at a time. Here's an example of a six move uh, round. One, two, three, four, five, six, and out. Two other interesting things with the game are the cow. If you roll a one, you can place the cow anywhere you want on the board and he leaves a poop there. If one of your chicka pigs slide through poop, you end up with a poop card, which have negative consequences. If you roll a two, you have the option to flip over a daisy card, which have all positive outcomes. That is chicka pig. It is for ages eight and up, two to four players. It takes about a half an hour to play a game. Uh, it will be in Target this late summer and it will also be released with a new children's book.